I recently read an article in which they highlighted an opportunity to volunteer for people that I thought was really interesting. They were looking for people to volunteer to cuddle with babies, like newborn babies, and not, but not just any babies. They were looking for people to cuddle with drug-addicted babies. Since the year 2000, the number of babies who are born addicted to drugs because they were delivered by parents who were addicted to drugs has increased by 383% in the United States. That is substantial. And these babies, who are incredibly vulnerable, have no ability to take care of themselves, have no ability to help themselves. They need to be weaned off the drugs. They need to go through a detox, basically, so that, um, so that they're no longer addicted to the drugs that are inside their body. And the hospitals have found that one of the things that helps a great deal is very simply having somebody cuddle with the babies and holding them for long periods of time. And so they're looking for volunteers to go to hospitals to do this. And if you're, looking, if you're looking to do that, just call your local hospital. They probably have a program that's set up to be able to do that. But they have found that the drug addicted babies who are held and cuddled for long periods of time, they need less medication and they get out of the hospital a lot sooner than the babies who don't have somebody hugging and cuddling them. They're vulnerable and they need help. This week in our talks together, we're gonna to be spending some time talking about how Jesus knows that we are vulnerable. Maybe not in exactly the same ways, but in, in many ways. He really acknowledges that when he uses the comparison, comparison to us as sheep and him as our shepherd. Sheep are incredibly vulnerable. It's not really all that flattering that the Bible compares us to sheep. I once saw a video of a sheep that got stuck in a tire swing. <laughs> so somehow, I don't know how, it got stuck in this tire swing and it tried to run out of the tire swing, but instead of getting out of the tire swing, it just went up in the air and then swung back and then went up in the air again and then swung back and then it finally hit the ground and then it tried to get out again and it went up in the air and it just kept going like this. And I never, I never saw the sheep get free from the tire swing. Maybe the person who took the video finally got them out. But it was completely vulnerable to getting stuck and sheep are vulnerable to getting stuck. They, um, they have these short little stubby sheep legs that can't get them out of much trouble and they're just soft and fluffy on the outside so they get stuck in the thorn branches. And Sheep are not only vulnerable to getting stuck, they're also vulnerable to getting hurt. Sheep have very poor eyesight. They, um, they can't tell if this fuzzy blob coming at them is, a, is a, another little lamb or a fierce mountain lion until it's, until it's too late. They also, they're pretty defenseless. They don't have the strength of an ox. They don't have the tail of a scorpion. They don't have the teeth of a shark to defend themselves. They just, they have nothing. They're vulnerable. And so are we. So are you. We'll talk a lot about our specific vulnerabilities as, as we go through the week, but, but as we get going into this week and as you think about the ways that you're vulnerable, the times in life that you don't feel safe, I want to leave you with a wonderful verse from the book of Deuteronomy where it says this. It says that underneath you are God's everlasting arms. Underneath you are God's everlasting arms. Maybe you feel vulnerable like those little drug addicted babies and you feel completely helpless to be able to move on in life with any kind of confidence. Well, underneath you are God's everlasting and loving arms. And they're the arms of a God who knows how it feels to be vulnerable. He was vulnerable on a cross. He was vulnerable in human skin. Vulnerable enough that his blood was shed, his skin was pierced. And through all of that, he proved that he's going to love you through everything. Those are the arms we're going to find refuge in this week. I'm glad to be here with you doing just that. I was once watching a television show in which they had a real-life doctor and a doctor called a reflexologist, which I had never heard of before. But a reflexologist is somebody who believes that really the solution to many of your life's pains is literally in your own hands. They brought up somebody on stage who said that she had had trouble sleeping, that um, just low energy, and that it had been going on this way for a very, very long time and she didn't know what to do about it. And so the reflexologist told her to put up her hand and to take the thumb of her opposite hand and to dig it, dig its nail into the middle of her opposite thumb and start rubbing it around. And I said, you should feel like there's like a little, little metal ball, it feels like, right in the middle of there. And I said, just do that for a while. And do that for a little bit every day. And eventually you'll be able to sleep well again. She didn't fall asleep on the spot, so I don't, you know, I don't know if it was accurate or not. But she went on to say that the solution to a lot of our pains are literally in, your, in our hands. She went on to say that if you're having right shoulder pain, 
then you should, uh, you should take your thumb and dig it right here underneath your, your pinky in the opposite hand and just rub that around for a while. If you're having left shoulder pain, just go to your, um, you know, just go to the other finger and start doing the same thing. If you're having stomach issues or digestive issues, they said, just aim for the middle of your palm and just rub around real gently. That's like that. If you're having spinal pain, so turn the, turn the hand around and picture your spinal cord going up and down and just aim for the spot where that would be the equivalent of where your pain is and start rubbing and eventually your pain will go away. Uh, just reminding us or encouraging us to think about maybe the solution to all of your pains is literally in your hands. Now that's a wonderful promise to be able to believe if that, if that were really true. Or maybe it is and maybe right now you're all just <laughs> you're all rubbing your palms to see if, uh, to see if your pain is going to go away. Um, in fact, I'm guessing some of you might at least try this because often we go through life and it feels like the solutions to our pains are completely out of our hands. Like if you've ever knelt by the hospital bed of someone that you love and the doctors don't have any clear solutions for what's happening. That can be really hard and you feel like this is out of my hands. Or if you've ever messed up, you made a really big mistake that hurt someone. And you don't know how to move forward again, feeling confident in yourself for being able to show the other person that you really do care about them. You can feel like, it's out of my hands. There are a lot of things that make us feel vulnerable or helpless to what's going to happen in the future. And Jesus, in fact, one day he saw an entire group of people that he identified as feeling the same way, completely helpless to be able to help themselves and eliminate whatever pains were going on in their lives. In the Gospel of Matthew, we see Jesus, um, we see Jesus looking out on a crowd of people and he saw something when he did. It says, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. That word harassed is really important. You think of something that harasses you, something awful that just comes after you again and again and again and again. And that can be sickness, it can be trouble, it can be temptation, it can be doubt, it can be worry, it can be fear. But that's what Jesus saw. People who were being assaulted in the most vulnerable parts of their hearts and of their minds. And he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. They were like sheep without a shepherd. But do you know why Jesus was there? Because he wanted to show them that they weren't actually without a shepherd. Jesus said in the, in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, which is known as the Good Shepherd chapter in the Bible, he said, very simply, I am the Good Shepherd. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And think about what happened when he laid down his life for the sheep. Our sins were forgiven, which means he proved that he could overcome sin for all of God's children. And Satan was overcome, which means he proved that he could overcome Satan for all of God's children. And death, when he came out of the grave, was shown to be weaker than his, his power and his ability to overcome, to overcome death. And, and he guaranteed a day when all of your troubles will just be wiped away. All of that happened when he laid down his life for the sheep. And I want you to think about the pain, your deepest pains in your hearts and in your mind right now. It falls underneath one of those categories. Categories of sin, Satan and his temptations, death, or just any trouble in the entire world. And if the Good Shepherd has already overcome them by laying down his life for the sheep, then you're not actually helpless anymore. You have a friend with you, a shepherd, who's really good to you. I mentioned yesterday that John chapter 10 is known as the Good Shepherd chapter because it's where Jesus spends a lot of time talking about how wonderful it is that we are his sheep and he is our good shepherd. And that's wonderfully comforting. There's an interesting conversation that Jesus had with a group of people in the middle of the Good Shepherd chapter. I'm going to read some of that conversation to you. Um, it starts at verse 22 in John chapter 10. It says, Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. Okay, and so they started by asking Jesus a very important question. They wanted to know if he was the Messiah and the reason why that was an important question was because of the promises related to the Messiah. The Messiah was the one who was supposed to come in and fix everything that was broken. He was supposed to come in and save the day. God had been promising the Messiah since the Garden of Eden. 
And boy, they were looking forward to him for the same reason you and I just love to look at the Messiah because it's, it's the one who's supposed to fix everything. Now, you should know something about this group that was talking to Jesus. When they asked, when they asked him, you know, are you in the Messiah? Tell us. We want to know. They were actually asking the question sarcastically. They didn't really care how he answered the question because they didn't believe that he was the Messiah. They didn't care how he answered it, but I bet you do. Because as we've been talking about this week, you have real vulnerabilities and we have real pains. And we want to know for sure if what he says is, is really, really true. But, you know, he looked, at the, he looked at this group and Jesus, he pointed out something that was so important. He said, you know what, I actually did tell you. I actually did tell you the truth. And then he pointed out, I've even done wonderful miracles to show you that I am really from God. I've done things that nobody else can. But, he said, you didn't listen. You didn't listen. And because they didn't listen and because Jesus said that one of the important characteristics of my sheep is that they listen to my voice, he was able to definitively look at them and say, you are not one of my sheep because you do not listen. And that might lead some to ask the very important question, how do you really know that you are one of Jesus' sheep? Because obviously not everyone is. Do you listen when he says you don't need to worry about anything? Do you listen when he says you don't need to be afraid? Do you listen when he says that he has great plans for you and you can trust him? Do you listen when he says you're forgiven? Do you listen when he says that in, your, in his father's house are so many rooms and he's already gone to prepare a place just for you? The reason he tells us to listen is not only because in his word he gives us such awesome guidance for what we're supposed to do in our lives. Every time we listen to his voice, it really reminds us of the same thing in so many different ways. That you're going to be okay. All his promises are promises of love, promises of protection, promises that you are being watched over by your Father in heaven. I'm going to share with you in... Um, of something that has become very useful to me in my life and in my ministry. There was a time in my life when I was, I was really struggling with something, um, full of anxiety, full of worry, and I, I, didn't know, I didn't know what to do or how to feel about it, and it was really getting me down, and I was talking to a friend on the phone, and he said, you know, he said, how are you feeling right now? And I said, well, I feel really worried. I feel really afraid, and for so many different reasons. And then he, he said, I understand. And then he paused, and he asked me this question. He said, which passage in the Bible are you thinking of right now where God gives you the right to feel that way? And I thought about it. And of course, there are none. There are no passages in the Bible where God says, oh, you better be afraid. <laughs> but there are so many where he says, you don't need to be afraid. There are no passages in the Bible that God says, you should be really worried about your life. But there is one where he says, you don't need to worry about your life or anything in it. There's no passage in the Bible where God says, you're not forgiven. There's so many assurances that you are. It's, a, it's, it's an interesting and it's become a very useful tool just to ask yourself, does God give me the right? Does God give me the right to feel at peace? Does God give me the right to feel confident? Does God give me the right to feel full of joy? Does God give me the right to feel loved and forgiven? We look at the cross of Jesus and the answer is, well, he sure does. We have the right to believe those things and that's one of the great ways that we are cared for by our Good Shepherd and our Father in Heaven. This week we're talking about different vulnerabilities that we feel in our lives and today we are going to be talking about the vulnerability to rejection, being rejected by someone. You ever been rejected by someone? I was. Um, I was cut from my eighth grade forensics team. The, uh, so forensics, that's public speaking. And uh, we, had an, we had a team in eighth grade and we were going to go to a forensics meet and there was only one slot left, but two of us who wanted to, uh, wanted to go to that one slot, to, to have that one slot <laughs> and go to the competition. And so the teacher had us give our presentations in front of the class and then the class would decide 
which one was better and who was going to be able to go to the competition. And so the first person went and she gave her presentation and then I went and I gave my presentation and then the class voted and I was rejected. <laughs> and I did not make the forensics team. And it felt awful that um, just a declaration that you will never do public speaking ever in your life. I think that was kind of funny. <laughs> but it doesn't, it doesn't feel good. And even thinking about that now, while I can laugh about it now, it doesn't, that, that feeling of, being rejected is a really awful feeling. Do you know? Do you know what living being has a long history of being rejected? The sheep. The sheep. Just look in the Old Testament. Go back to the Old Testament when the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, and the very first Passover. That the way that the Israelites were going to be set free from their slavery in Egypt was they were supposed to take one of their sheep, the best one, in fact, the best one they have, and the sheep was supposed to be, in a sense, rejected. It was going to be killed and and thrown away, and its blood was supposed to be taken and put over the door frames. And that would be the sign when the Lord passed through that they would pass over those homes and the people inside the homes would be, would be safe. But those, those sheep needed to be rejected or thrown away in order for them to be safe. Go through the Old Testament and there are so many different types of sacrifices, sin sacrifices, guilt sacrifices, lots of different sacrifices. Over and over again, you get the people of God bringing their sheep these cute little fuzzy sheep to, uh, to the temple and sacrificing them, throwing them away, rejecting them as a way of saying, we love you, God. Um, it, was a pretty, it, was a pretty bloody, it was a pretty bloody thing. In fact, most of, the, most of the sacrifices in the Old Testament required a lot of blood. In fact, there was one day in the Old Testament that was exceptionally bloody. You know, I don't know if I would have enjoyed living in Israel during this time. If it, my stomach can't handle a whole lot of blood, and maybe yours can't either, so I'm glad God didn't have me live back then. But, but there was one day that was particularly bloody, and that was called the Day of Atonement. It was one of the high festivals, and what would happen on the Day of Atonement is that a sheep would be brought, and it would be sacrificed. It would be killed as a sacrifice for the sins of the priest who was serving. And then they would take the blood from that sheep, and put it in a bowl and the priest would go back into the back room of the temple where the Ark of the Covenant was and then he would dip his hands into that bloody bowl and then he would take the blood on his hands and he would sprinkle them over the cover of the Ark and then he would dip and then he would do that seven times and then he would dip his hands in the bowl of, again and they would be covered with blood and then he would sprinkle them seven more times over a different area of the Ark of the Covenant. And then after he did that, the 14 times, then he would go back out to the front of the temple on the front steps and two goats would be brought to him. And one goat would be killed and its blood taken in a bowl and then he would take that bowl and go back into the back room again and he would dip his hands into the bowl of blood seven more times and sprinkle just like he did and then seven more times just like he did and then he would come back out to the front steps again having not washed his hands. And so picture what his hands are looking like. He has dipped his hands into a bowl of blood at least 28 times without washing them. And then he would take his hands that are covered in blood and then he would put them on top of the other goat's head and blame the goat for all of the people's sins all their mistakes. And then once he did that, he would send the goat away and it would go out into the wilderness all by itself where it would die in a lonely place. You know what that goat was called? It was called the scapegoat. A goat that was not guilty of any sins and yet it was blamed and punished as if it was the one who had committed all of those sins. And by doing all of this, with all these vulnerable sheep and vulnerable goats and lambs, God was highlighting two things. Number one, he sees the reality of our sins and they are a big deal to him. Every sin costs a life. That's what he wanted to emphasize with the blood. Sin costs a life. It's, it's not a small thing when we are impatient with one another, when we are unkind or when we hold grudges or refuse to forgive. Those aren't small things. It costs a life. A life needs to be given. And we can feel vulnerable to that because on how many days can we go through when we don't feel guilty about anything? I don't know if there are any. We make mistakes, we commit sins, we hurt people, sometimes without even trying. And that makes our hearts sink. And we wonder if there's going to be a rejection coming from God. But that's the second point that God was making with the scapegoat. With giving them the picture of the scapegoat that would happen on every day of atonement, he was assuring them that one day I'm going to send a scapegoat for you. Somebody who is not guilty of any sin, but is going to take the blood that's on our hands and it's going to be put on his head 
and then he is going to go out and go die in a lonely place all by himself. Except it wasn't in a desert. It was on a cross. And the scapegoat was Jesus. And Jesus even announced that he was going to be that scapegoat when he said this. Talking to his disciples, he said, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. He made himself vulnerable on a cross to take the punishment for our sin so that you could walk through life knowing that in Christ you are accepted. In Christ you are loved. In Christ you are always forgiven. And if you ever doubt that, you always get to go back and look at the Lamb. And it will always tell you the same thing. A woman named Sheena lives in Mississippi. And one day she was driving to her daughter's daycare to pick up her four-year-old daughter, Ashton. When she got to the daycare, she was surprised to discover that the daycare was no longer there. It was, it was a real building. It had been there before, but a tornado had touched down in their town just very, very quickly that day, right on top of the daycare and annihilated the whole thing. No one at the daycare called mom or dad to let anyone know that that had happened. All the contact info was inside the daycare at the time. And so when she got to the daycare and saw the building collapse, not knowing where her daughter was, she got out of her car and she started, she started going through the ruins. But she didn't find her daughter, her four-year-old daughter Ashton, there in the ruins. And I want you to think about how she felt. Because I'm guessing some of you have felt the same or similar thing to what she did. Vulnerable. As we think of death. As we face death, some of you, I'm guessing, have faced it very recently with someone you love. For others, your heart just feels heavy when you think about someone for whom death seems to be coming somewhat quickly, maybe a little bit too quickly. And for others still, maybe it's been a while since the person you love died and you've done a pretty good job scabbing over the wounds that created when that happened, but it doesn't take much to rip those scabs open again. You know, like a certain place, a certain smell, or a certain day on the calendar when you used to celebrate something, we we feel so vulnerable to death, just like Sheena did as she was digging through the rubble. She never found her daughter in the rubble there, in the pile, even though she was only one of two people inside the building at the time. The other one was Ruth, the owner of the daycare. And the rescue workers, they did find Ruth. And when the rescue workers pulled Ruth out from the rubble, they saw that Ruth was dead. But they also noticed that Ruth was holding something in her arms. And do you know what that was? It's a little four-year-old girl named Ashton, and she was alive, and she still is. The reason, the reason mom didn't find Ashton when she, went through, when she went through the rubble and she was going through the pile on her own was because she had already been taken to the hospital long before mom got there and she was already recovering. Sometimes moms, not even moms, can be there for their children all the time and that makes us feel vulnerable to not be able to be there for the people that we love, but in her case, she didn't need to be there. She just needed someone who was determined to be there for, for her and determined to keep her safe no matter what it cost them. You know, and Ruth, the daycare worker, isn't the only person to ever do such a thing. Jesus did too. And it cost him a lot. When he came into the ruins of this world, nails were pounded into him. Flesh was, was ripped off of his bones. And though he could have left at any moment, and nobody would have blamed him, instead he just chose to hang there in the middle of a dark sky, hanging on a cross, to let us know that he really will do whatever it takes to keep you safe forever in the everlasting arms of our great God and Father. We were saved that day by a Jesus who obviously knows how it feels to have vulnerabilities, but whose empty grave on Easter morning obviously proves that he also knows how to overcome them, which is exactly what he promises to do for every fragile, vulnerable little lamb that he has already made into one of God's own children. This is what Jesus himself said in John chapter 10, the Good Shepherd chapter, where he said, I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. No one shall snatch them out of my hand. And just think about what that means. If the day when we will finally be free from all weakness and pain is something that has already been given, and if our loved ones who have died in faith have never really perished, according to Jesus, but are right now really living, and if the shepherd, who has already proven to be stronger than sin and death and trouble and Satan, has promised to hold you safely in his hand until you get to hold your loved ones again. And do you know what that means? It means there is never really a time in your life when you are unsafe. No matter your vulnerabilities, 
you're always going to be okay. Do you struggle to find time to connect with God? Well, click here to subscribe to our daily email where we'll make sure that you hear about God's promises, his love, and his amazing word.